Hello and welcome back to Chess Openings Explained. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and today we are going to be taking you through part 982 of the Nidorf. Today we're focusing on the 13th side variation. No, of course, just kidding. We're done with the Nidorf. I hate that opening. No more. Ten videos was enough. Uh, today, as the title says, we're going to be taking a look at some pretty awful, horrible chess openings. Um, that were played by Michael John ba uh, Baseman, Bassman, not entirely sure how to say his name. He is uh, an English chess international master that was big back in the 1980s, even a little bit before that. And uh, he was well known for playing some of the most uh, horrible, awful, garbage chess openings that I have ever seen. Uh, and so I'm going to be taking you through some of these games. We're going to see how, uh, you know, Michael is flaunting opening principles left and right and why he's getting away with it. Why isn't he losing these games outright? Thought it'd be a nice little bit of a fun break after the grueling series on the Night Orf, the theory heavy, the, the serious stuff. So we'll take a look at it here. Um, up first, I have a game between Frank Babar against Michael John Basman, of course. Uh, and Frank, I had to Google his name, unfortunately, was not familiar with him. And he's around 2100 Fide. So we're, we're starting off a little bit, you know, a little bit slowly here. All right. But I promise you, this Michael John Baseman guy, he, he, can beat, he can beat the real chess players. But we're going to start off with this game because it was, you know, absolutely insane. And I thought I should definitely highlight it. So Frank, being a chess player, you know, Bobby Fischer fan, says E4, best by test. And, you know, I, I'm pretty sure Michael just, like, looks at the chessboard, starts thinking on move one. And this game, he came up with the move h6. So h6, of course, not going to be the most advisable opening of all time. Uh, of course, it does not control the center. It does not develop any pieces. It does not go towards getting the king to safety. And makes very, very little sense. So why is Michael playing this move h6? Well, we'll see a little bit later on if he reveals his hand. And then Frank, being a weirdo, plays the move b3. And it was at this point that, uh, you know, I, I could already tell we were going to be in for quite a game. So what do we think about this move b3? Why does white play b3 here? Well. Maybe Frank was a little bit familiar with his opponent and knew that Michael had a very serious tendency to play the move g5 to follow up h6. And this is sort of the types of games Michael was famous for playing. He would go for an early g5. He did play the grob quite often with white as well. And he would go for some kind of king's side attack. So I think Frank may have been prepping for this move 1h6, believe it or not. And now, g5, of course, is very heavily discouraged because this bishop is going to land on b2. So at this point, Michael sort of switches gears, plays the move e6 instead. We see bishop b2, b6, g3, and now bishop b7, and bishop g2. So what do you guys think about how white handled uh, Michael's treatment of the opening here? Uh, of course, Frank faces 1h6 by black, and then he immediately double fianchettos. Uh, what do you think about this response to, uh, to Michael's opening play? We're going to see a few different approaches tonight uh, in how to respond to, to the absolute insanity that Michael has been playing throughout his chess career. And this, I think, is, is a little bit more conservative. So what do we, how do we feel about this? Manny says, why b3 and g3? Isn't this a little weakening? And yeah, a lot of people in the chat here are hitting upon sort of the, the right idea. So in the opening, we very much should value our time. Every move we play costs us you know, one unit of time, a tempo. And so if white can use those tempo, uh, those temp B rather, make them very valuable early, early on, then black is going to feel very unhappy about playing the move h6. If white is able to open things up, activate his pieces right away, take over the center of the board, black may live to regret playing this little h6 move. However, when you play as Frank has played here with b3, g3, bishop b2, bishop g2, it's true that white gets a very, very solid position. But at the end of the day, um, he's not going to be left with that much of an advantage, right? You know, what did you do when black gave you a free move with h6? 
uh, well, uh, Frank played b3 and developed the bishop out to b2. Not a bad piece by any means, but it's not really going to refute uh, Michael's opening here. So knight f6 appears on the board, uh, uh, threatening this e4 pawn very directly. So we see d3 by Frank, and then believe it or not, it's actually Michael who starts to take over the center with the move d5. So now at this point, uh, Frank could have gone for some King's Indian attack style positions, something like knight e2. Uh, to, to follow maybe knight d2 would be a good start as well, but instead he decides to take over the center with e5. And now knight fd7 by Michael, and d4 is the follow-up by Frank. And already, I have to confess, I'm starting to like black's position. Uh, why do I like black's position here? Well, Frank's opening, uh, well, you know, classically following the principles, I think is actually worse than Michael John Baseman's here. And that is even after Michael has played the move 1h6. And that's part of why I wanted to highlight this game and a lot of the games that we're going to see in the lecture here today. Um, just because your opponent plays one or two awful, horrible, horrible looking moves doesn't mean they are going to get the worst position of all time. Yes, Michael played h6 on move one. Yes, it does not control the center or develop any pieces or help castle the king. But after that, his play has been very logical. He piled up his pieces on e4. He provoked the pawn to move to e5. And now he is going to target the center with the move c5. Look to activate this bishop a little bit later on. And all of his pieces will be serving useful purposes here. Uh, not only that, but he still has some options open to even try to expand on the king's side a little bit later on. So even h6 may turn out to be a useful move. In the meantime, white has developed two bishops, two fianchettos, and they are both staring at an entirely closed center. And that is, that is how white has spent his time here. Uh, white now continues with c3, further proving that this bishop is a mistake. Uh, knight c6 is natural development, knight e2. And now bishop a6. And suddenly, even this bishop that once looked pretty bad for black is active once again. Castles is played, and then we just see it captures on d4, captures on d4, and then h5. So now officially stating that h6 was just a waste of a tempo. But what has black done? Well, he's gotten white to commit his king to the king side. He's found nice solid pressure on the d4 pawn. He's made his opponent's pieces fairly bad out of the opening, and he has, you know, a pretty reasonable plan. So uh, while, of course, classically we would say he played a horrible, horrible opening with h6, uh, now when the dust is settling, I'm not so sure white is thrilled with how this game has gone. White continued with the move h4, going for f5 plans, and just h4 by Baseman here. You know, he's not even done developing. Right, This knight is very, very loose on c6. This bishop has not moved. The king is in the center. He doesn't care. He's pushing on the king's side. He's going to go mate the guy. Uh, g4 by Frank keeps the h file closed and helps prepare f5. But now h3 takes even more space for Michael John Baseman. Bishop f3. And now queen out to h4. And a3. And yeah, like I keep saying here, I think I would even rather be black in, in this position. White's pieces just make absolutely no sense. They are just scattered throughout the board. And while black's pieces aren't the most coordinated of all time, I think they make more sense than, uh, than white's here. The bishop on a nice open diagonal. This bishop controlling some squares, even if it hasn't moved. And the knight pressuring the center a little bit. This knight, admittedly, doesn't make the most sense. But hey, you know what? Three out of four is not bad. Uh, Michael follows this up with g5, which I will say is maybe a little bit too much, but it is definitely in the spirit of how he's been playing the position. Frank plays this move f5. We see uh, e takes on f5. Bishop takes on d5. And now this pawn is hanging with check. I'm not entirely certain why it wasn't captured. I would probably recommend capturing this guy, but rook c8 instead is just defending the knight, and this is what was played. And then both players absolutely lose their mind. Bishop takes f7 appears on the board. Rook takes f5 check. King e8, knight g3. Um, and now knight e7 is the move for white, knight d2. And I would like you guys to find the only move for black that equalizes here. Can you find one of the only moves for black to equalize the game? You could argue that you know maybe a few moves are playable. 
but I think this is the best move to equalize and probably the best move to, uh, to play for an advantage here. What do you guys think? Try to get in the mindset of Michael John Baseman. Think of how you've been playing this opening. You know what you want to do. Mm -mm. Wow, and Danilo has successfully channeled his inner Michael Baseman. Of course, of course, we are pushing the H-pawn down the board one step at a time. Are we going to let a puny little H-pawn get in our way? No. No, of course we are not. You got to take that knight, get rid of that H-pawn, and push H2. All right, King H1 by Frank, and now there's just one piece remaining. One piece standing in the path of, uh, of this H-pawn. How are we going to get rid of it? Well, Baseman starts by taking a free rook, which makes sense. We have G takes F5, and now Bishop B7 check. And suddenly... You know, white is running out of squares on this diagonal and may very, very quickly just be checkmated. Uh, he finds a good move here, Frank does, with the move d5. Uh, and now, of course, if bishop takes d5, we would see knight f3. And this bishop has sort of been drawn to an undefended square. Uh, so instead of that, uh, Michael, you know, just down a queen, you know, is like, yeah, casually, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll attack the pawn again with my rook. And then here, you know, Chess is fun and all, but sometimes it's, it's not this fun. White does, in fact, miss a win here, although there are only really two moves that do it. Uh, the idea is to go queen f3, and the point now is that you can occupy the e4 square with your knight rather than the f3 square. And now white is going to be able to successfully sort of blockade on this, di on this long diagonal and should end up surviving the day. But instead, e6 is played, and rook takes d5 now. Uh, of course, e takes d7 would be met by rook takes d7 with check. Knight here loses to checkmate, so you would have to give the queen back. And again, black is actually going to be better because he has more rooks in this position. This rook can save itself. Oh yeah, by the way, e6 attacks both of these pieces. It's a wild game. Rook takes d5 was played. Knight c5 was the follow-up for Michael John Baseman. Again, just bringing more pieces, and this time... Uh, by the way, okay, so white plays queen f3 first, the idea being if rook d2, then of course bishop, queen b7. So Michael John Baseman just defends this bishop. Bishop takes h8 is played, now rook takes d2. The queen comes off the board, and the dust has settled. Michael John Baseman is up a knight, and goes on to win this game pretty convincingly here. The rooks get traded, and uh, Frank Babar resigns. So that is the first Michael John Baseman I wanted to show you guys. Um... This can't be a classical match? Uh, I'm pretty sure it was. I'm pretty sure. I didn't do super deep research. This was the Lloyds Bank Masters Open. But, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's easy to say after seeing that game, right? Okay, both players were going a bit crazy. Frank, you know, very decent chess player, I'm sure, but not exactly, you know, world class. Uh, he was around 2100 fide when I looked him up. Probably he was a bit stronger at the time of this game. But uh, what, what, what would you say? If I were to tell you that Michael John Baseman was not just doing this to, you know, these random, you know, fairly high level uh, chess players throughout England, he was doing it to England's best chess players, and we'll see with the final game of the lecture, he did something even more absurd against the one and only Ulf Anderson, uh, of course, incredible chess player, uh, and he's getting away with it in all these games. So why don't we take a look now? At one Jonathan Spielman. Let's see how Spielman took on Michael John Baseman and what funny opening moves we have in store this time. So, one e4 was played, and perhaps Michael John Baseman, in light of the game with Frank Babar, realized that h6 is just not good enough, right? h6 isn't good enough. It gives them time to get on this diagonal, stopping his idea of g5, right? So he makes an improvement. He plays g5 first. Good luck playing b3 now, buddy. I'm getting on the diagonal, right? So, 1g5 by Michael John Baseman. Of course, this opening, sometimes known as the Borg, not named after the Star Trek characters, but named after the Grob opening in reverse. G-R-O-B in backwards, of course, is B-O-R-G, the Borg, and that's what we have here from Baseman. 
Uh, now, Jonathan takes a little bit more of a classical approach to trying to refute this stuff, not going for these double fianchettos, sort of wasting time back, but instead seizing the center directly, challenging the pawn on g5. We see now h6 by Michael John Baseman. You know, he's crazy, but he's not that crazy. His pawn's attacked, he's going to defend it. And then, chat, how would you like to go about um, challenging uh, Black's position here? h6, g5 is on the board. You've spent your two moves playing e4, d4. Probably you should have some advantage here, but how do you prove it? What do you want to do? <clears throat> what do you want to do? And yeah, I think this is going to be the opportunity to talk about some common mistakes that are made when uh, people end up in these kinds of positions. So, what Jonathan Spielman decided to do, and what is a perfectly acceptable way of playing, is play the move h4. He wanted to break things open on the h file directly, force uh, concessions from Michael John Baseman directly, uh, before he could even get developed. So, in this case, h4 is actually going to be a very, very good move. Why is that? Well, there's no good way for black to defend this pawn. Uh, of course, this is pinned uh, along the h file indirectly. If bishop g7 is played, we see h takes g and h takes g. And at the end of the day, this bishop comes in to save the day and win a pawn for white. Of course, e6 doesn't do it because then this pin is very, very relevant. Um, so black is faced with this awkward decision. He has to go g4 or he has to take on h4. In this game, we see g takes h4 by Michael Baseman. Um, but backing up here, let's talk about some of the things I was seeing in the chat. I saw a lot of people actually uh, suggesting the move e5, and I think this is a horrible, horrible mistake. Um, why is e5 a horrible, horrible mistake? Well, as always, even when your opponent is sort of wasting time in the opening, there's a very, very fine line between having central space and being overextended. Uh, of course, notably in openings like the French and Karo Khan, if you moved these pawns over here, these pawns over here, I guess, then you would get the exact same structure, and black isn't altogether unhappy about it. This uh, is a good way to end up with weak pawns in the center. Black could immediately start challenging these pawns with something like d6 if uh, white ends up taking. C takes d5. Next thing you know, yes, black played h6, g5 and spent time doing it, but white played e4, e5, e takes d, right? So not exactly the you know, fastest opening play getting developed by white either. Neither side would have any pieces developed, and black is actually sort of uh, well prepared to open up this diagonal uh, uh, bearing down on the queen side. So e5 would be a very, very bad mistake, I think. My personal way uh, my personal favorite way to play against these kinds of openings is not really to do the crazy stuff like h4. Yes, in this particular case, it gives you uh, very definite advantages, which is probably why Spielman decided to play it. But my favorite thing to do is develop my pieces, right? You know, I say to my opponent, do whatever you want. I'm developing my pieces, something like queen d2, uh, knight c6, queenside castles, and you just develop your pieces, right? If you just develop your pieces in this case, you are always going to get a good position here. Um, no matter what your opponent is sort of doing, as long as you're developing your pieces and you're careful about it, you know, acknowledging any threats they're making in the center, then you're just going to get a good position. Let me flip on the engine here. This position is plus two, right? All white did is develop his pieces, and the engine gives plus two here. Why does it give plus two? Well, it's because black is without a plan and white's pawns are not overextended. For example, black would love to play something like e5, but this doesn't even force a response now by white, doesn't even force white to overextend. The simple move f3, and white is defending all of his weaknesses uh, you know, very, very well. But that's not what we see in this game. In this game, uh, Jonathan, out for blood, plays the move h4. Uh, and as I did say, we do see g takes h4 by Michael John Baseman. Rook takes h4, activating the rook, may as well. d5 now for uh, Baseman, uh, challenging the center. A uh, couple moves late, but you know, still adamant 
uh, about controlling the center eventually. e takes d5 is Spielman's response. And now if queen takes d5, I think the issue is just that knight c3 is coming with tempo. And you know the queen d8 Scandinavian might be playable when you go d5, queen d5, queen d8 immediately. But here, it's just not going to work. You're wasting too much time. So this turns into uh, the move e6, the point being uh, black is taking advantage of the temporarily awkward placement of this rook in order to capture back on d5 with the pawn. Rook h5 is played. Knight f6 gains time on the rook again. Or does it? We see d takes e6. And now knight takes h5 might not be the most advisable when your king is getting pushed uh, way out into the open and white is getting plenty of pawns. So after d takes e, we saw bishop takes e6, and it is just a pawn sacrifice. And then Spielman gives up this rook on h5, which probably is unnecessary. And uh, I think now knight takes h5, queen takes h5. Yes, white still has a very decent position, but I think, um, I think black is sort of out of the worst of it here. Uh, and this is a, a pretty significant mistake, I think, both objectively and, you know, sort of practically, psychologically, practically over the board, I think this is a pretty huge mistake. Why is that? Well, if uh, Jonathan had instead chosen just to sort of retreat this rook all the way back to h1 even, and we see some move like knight b to d7, or maybe even like c5, uh, what do we have here? Well, we have white with an extra pawn. You know, three pawns missing for black, only two pawns missing for white. And we have white with less weaknesses in the position. This pawn on d4 is sort of the only thing that's been advanced that, you know, could be considered a weakness. Whereas this pawn on h6 is going to be very, very weak. This pawn on uh, f7 is isolated. And all white has to do now is develop simply. And he's going to have a very nice advantage, right? White's going to have an advantage here up an extra pawn. Black has some development in exchange for it. But black, like I said, all the long-term things are in white's favor. Now, what do we see after knight c3? Takes and takes. Well, rather than being down a pawn for nothing, black is up the exchange for a pawn. And this gives black something to play for, right? You know, the pressure's no longer on black. Black doesn't have to, you know, fight back to win material, make use of this development right away. Black now can sort of sit back and say, yeah, I'm up material, you know? Uh, my h6 g5 stuff is, is really uh, working out for me here. I'm up the exchange on move 9. Why doesn't everybody play like this? And that's a good question. So bishop b4 was played in the game. Just natural development now for Michael Baseman. Knight e2, knight c6. Of course, there's no d5 thanks to the pin on the king. And now bishop e3 for white and queen d7 for black. And I want to mention something else about uh, Baseman's play in this opening here. Of course, he goes crazy on the king side, h6, g5, things get opened up. But notably, you see both players actually leave this nice little pawn shield on the queen's side. And that's generally the thing you have to do when you're playing these types of crazy openings with either side, right? You have to have some kind of plan for your king. In the first game, uh, his game stayed in the center, but also in that game, the center was very, very closed, and it only opened up when white was sacrificing pieces on f7, which may have not been the most advisable. So here, center is open, so both players leave the queen side open for their kings. Um, a3 is now white's decision, and I think this move is perfectly fine. Trying to force this bishop to make a decision if it wants to trade itself off here and bring white's other knight into the game or retreat. Uh, Michael throws in a very nice intermezzo here in the form of bishop g4. The queen goes to b5. And now, who is it really that was breaking opening principles this whole time? This queen is getting kicked around. Black is using the extra time to develop his pieces even more. Queen d3 is played. We now do see bishop take c3. Uh, and not knight takes c3 when castling would be made temporarily illegal, but queen takes c3 instead. And queen side castles for uh, black, f3 for white, bishop e6, and queen side castles for white. And now we are nearing the end of the opening. And what has happened? Well, at the end of the day, 
Black has all these same weaknesses that we talked about earlier, but both sides have gotten castled. Uh, black's pieces are fully developed. White is almost fully developed. You could argue that this bishop needs some work, but I think it's, it's going to be reasonably fine. Has plenty of squares to choose from on, the, uh, on this diagonal, and it's not that bad on f1 either, uh, keeping an eye on the a6 pawn. But black's up in exchange. Why is black up in exchange? Well, because Jonathan Spielman wanted to be a hero, wanted to sacrifice early on to try and refute the opponent's opening. And in my opinion, that is a recipe for disaster. The way to play against these openings is not in this form of Jonathan Spielman, in my opinion. Uh, it, while the objective best moves will lead you to victory in most cases against these things, it's hard to play objectively correct chess against this style of play. Why is that? You have no intuition, right? These, these positions are just absolutely crazy. You have to calculate on every turn and try to get your pieces to squares that make some kind of sense. And if you can't do that, then if you play this ultra combative style with h4 and rook takes h4, you, you might find yourself on the worst end, the worst end of things uh, with the white pieces. And that's exactly what happened to Jonathan Spielman. Now, if you do what I suggested, develop your pieces, control the center, I think it is much, much easier to play. Don't try to refute the opening, just find squares for your pieces, and then you can play a chess game. Um, okay, though, the game continues. White is making a threat. Look out. Knight e7 is Michael's choice, uh, gaining control again of the d5 square. Knight f4 for white now, again, making this threat. So knight d5 blockades. We see takes, takes. The queen actually comes back to d2 now, and queen c6. And white has the bishop pair. Black still has these weaknesses. But why is white down in exchange? I don't know. I don't understand this sacrifice from Jonathan Spielman, but that's what happened in the game. So king b1, and now black goes about the business of fixing the problems in his position so that his extra rook can be felt. This pawn is very, very weak. So in classic uh, Baseman style, he says, yeah, I'll push it forward. Bishop g5 attacks a rook. Rook d to e8 saves a rook, something Jonathan Spielman should take some notes on, perhaps. Bishop f4, bishop c4. Uh, black now uh, offers the trade of the light squared bishops to get rid of this bishop pair. And I think at this, at this point, uh, it's pretty clear that black is the one with all the advantage in this case. This h-pawn is no longer really weak. The bishop pair is coming off the board. And black is just in exchange for a pawn ahead. Bishop b5 was played. This rook has to move, but not. it's not so unhappy about it, pressuring the g-pawn. D5 by Spielman was the choice, but this just tactically fails to bishop takes d5. And now, of course, queen takes d5 would be met with, uh, I believe, queen takes d5, right? Am I seeing this correctly? Yeah, queen takes d5. Wait, this was simpler. OK, yeah, queen takes d5 and f6, right? For some reason, I was thinking c6, but of course, um, no, wait, not f6. Oh, god. There's like one tactic in this whole game, and I'm messing it up. Interesting. I'll have to have to cheat here momentarily. Oh god, it's all going downhill. It's all going downhill. All right, where are we? There's one tactic in the whole game, and I can't even figure it out. All right. Of course, queen takes d5 would fail to rook d8 with this. Okay. Yeah, skewer. Everybody knows skewers. I thought it was this bishop on e5, but no. There is rook d8. So d5, unfortunately, just a losing move due to the tactic found by Michael Baseman, not found by me. Better chess player than I. Uh, and so queen d4 was played instead. But this is the beginning of the end now. Uh, bishop to b3 was the try for, uh, for Michael Baseman. And this actually doesn't work. This, uh, this actually does lose the game back. Uh, rook d8 was the simple move, and it was the correct move. Bishop a2 check is sort of impossible to stop, along with the threat of just any bishop move challenging these guys. For example, king c1 would mean bishop f3. And this is busto. But bishop b3 actually doesn't quite work. White could capture this guy. And white actually does have a counter tactic after rook d8 with the move rook c1. Uh, and so Jonathan Spielman could have actually still won this game because the tactics got a bit messy here. But instead, bishop d3 was played. And now rook d8. And black, once again, is firmly in control. Takes on d3. Queen b6. There's no checkmate. And exchange up. Now pawns up. This was a clean victory from here on out for Michael John Baseman.
pushing on the king's side, and here white ended up resigning. So, not just patzers that Michael John Baseman is beating with this h6 and g5 stuff. He has taken down Jonathan Spielman. What was Spielman's mistake in this game? Well, of course, the tactics were messy. There were chances for Wolf players eventually. But at its core, I think uh, Jonathan Spielman's mistake was trying to refute the opening with this h4, rook, h4, rook, h5 stuff. You just don't need to do this. This is what players with the black pieces want you to do because they, they thrive on the craziness. They thrive on it. They are playing these positions on purpose, and you don't need to get sucked into that stuff. You can... In fact, just develop your pieces. Just develop your pieces. Just knight c3, bishop b3, stuff like f f3. You know, you don't even need to engage. Don't even need to engage here. Just queenside castles, knight c6, and black's position is just going to crumble eventually. In fact, I think this is already immediately just very, very good for white. Winning, winning material already if black were to play like this. So that's my advice if you face this. Just develop your pieces. All right, so that's one great English chess player down. Who's up next? Who's up next? Well, how about famed author and chess composer John Nunn? That's right, even John Nunn was falling victim to Michael John Baseman's craziness here. And let's just jump into the game. Why waste any time? So the previous two games, we've seen Michael Baseman with the black pieces doing this sort of absurdity with g5 and h6. Now we'll give him his shot with the white pieces. And again, we are going to see the g-pawn move with one g4. Uh, d5 by John Nunn hits this pawn on g4. And now we see h3 by white defending the pawn. e5 is the follow-up now for John Nunn. And we see d3 for Michael John Baseman. So I think what he is attempting to do here is go for some kind of light squared control, right? This is sort of the, the idea at the heart of the grab. You put this bishop on g2, and you start trying to break down all of these light squares uh, for black. And at the end of the day, you get some kind of awful English where these two pawns should be here, and you should have two extra moves. But, you know, since you want to play the grab, you put the pawns here instead and waste two moves doing it. Uh, but at its core, you know, it has a good idea. It's, it's a similar idea to the English. So let's see if uh, white is able to enact this here. We do see c4 land on the board, c6, knight c3. White using all of his moves now to challenge these central light squares after going you know, of course, g4, h3 first, knight e7, knight f3, h5 now for black, and again, we see g takes h5 and rook takes h5. And everybody loves doing this. Every, like, everybody seems to think this is the way to play against the grob. And while it does make some sense, right, you want to target this weak h-pawn, why not force this concession from white? At the same time, I think black's time just would have been better served developing, right? You can castle king's side here, right? Develop the bishop to e6, you know, develop the knight to d7 even. Go f5 later, go f6 if you want to be solid. Just preserve your center. Don't get sucked in to the nonsense. But instead, we do see h5 and rook h5. Bishop b2, bishop d2 is the idea now for white. And after a6, I want to ask you guys to find Michael John Baseman's next move. I think this one is actually a, a pretty instructive one here. Um, because, you know, it might be counterintuitive at first glance to find the move that, that Michael does end up playing, but I think it is quite sensible in many of these positions that you actually end up in with the grab. What is this opening called? Yeah, technically it is called the grab. The grab attack, some might say. Is it safe to castle into g4? Your position is always safe when you have pieces developed and your opponent does not. When you control the center, pieces are developed, your position is safe. Mm -mm. Also, in that position I showed, um, of course, black's knight being on e7 rather than f6 is actually pretty advantageous because it means 
g5 is not going to come with tempo, and black would have plenty of time to do something about it. So c takes d4 is not actually the idea. Um, knight a4 is definitely not the idea. Why You don't want to move pieces away from the center. And yeah, e4 is going to be the very good idea for white in this position that I wanted to talk about. So why e4? It seems to run, you know, sort of against our entire plan of putting the bishop on g2 and breaking down the light squares. Well, if you take a look at black's moves, knight e7, uh, b7, c6, uh, d5, bishop e6, I'm sure, is to follow, along with the opening up of half of the g-file here. You can easily imagine a major piece landing on the g-file, pressuring this bishop. Well, white is playing very, or black is playing very much against this idea of playing bishop g2. And this move e4 is actually forcing black to make very concrete decisions right away. Right now, black's king is in the center, white's king is in the center, and neither of them really know what they're going to do. And so, if black plays the move d4, uh, white is going to be very happy to bring, uh, to actually play a tactic here with knight takes d4. But even if the tactic didn't exist, now knight a4 would be very playable with the idea of c5 and knight b6 to follow. Or even something like knight e2, uh, knight g6, knight g3, I think would be fine for white. Right, just in general here, the closing of the center, I think, is going to be in white's favor because white's king was sort of sitting so forlorn in the center of the board like this. So I don't think black's happy about closing the center in general in these positions, and specifically there is a tactic here where queen takes h5, dc3, and bishop c3, I think, would uh, materially go in white's favor with the king side sort of crumbling as well. Uh, so, black now has to decide what he wants to do with this d-pawn. If he tries to just keep it on the board with something like uh, bishop to e6, you might see these come off the board, and now knight g5, and now the light squares are finally actually crumbling along this diagonal. Um, if he plays the move d takes e4, well, that's what happened in the game, and white was happy to take back with the pawn. Uh, notably, d takes c4 would have achieved the same, and it was maybe better for black since you don't allow any possibility of knight takes e4. And then you end up in this position. And what's going on in this position? Well, white is sort of shifting the story away from the king's side weaknesses. Now, the d file has opened up as well, and I think this is where a lot of the conflict might happen for control of you know, this, the center. Black is going to have to be very, very wary now of how he develops the pieces with this bishop sitting uh, on d6 a little bit loose and the queen still stuck on d8. Um, so knight d7 was played by black. And now how should white continue? Right, you've got some problems to solve here. The king is stuck in the center. This queen doesn't really belong in the open file. You'd rather have a rook there. Speaking of, there's a rook still on a1. How do you activate the pieces? How do you activate the pieces here with white? Because this is always your goal in the opening. Even when you're playing the crazy stuff, your goal is to find activity. So queen e2 or c2 seems normal. Yes, it would seem normal. And these are playable moves for white. But much better is actually the move knight g5. You take advantage once again of this misplaced rook. It's becoming sort of a theme in these games. You know, black seemingly very happy about g takes h5, rook takes h5. But then always wasting a ton of tempi moving this rook around. Or in Jonathan Spielman's case, just losing the rook entirely. Um, so knight g5 did appear on the board. Knight f6 was black's best try to not lose time with the rook. And now queen f3 is actually a much better square than either e2 or c2, when now it is again white with all of the pressure in the position. Right, This little h-pawn on h3 that looked so weak moments ago is defended no fewer than four times, and it's seemingly totally irrelevant to the position. Right, How is black going to fix this king? How is black going to fix these pieces? Uh, 
And what, what does black have in exchange for all of this? Well, a half open h file with some pressure on the h3 pawn. Just doesn't seem like enough to me. Knight g6 was the follow up for black. And now, of course, queenside castles. And once again, despite playing a wild and crazy opening, John, uh, Michael John Basement has found um, you know, harmony for all of his pieces. Right, This knight on g5, very actively placed, pressuring f7 in tandem with the queen. This knight on c3 might not have very good jumping prospects yet, but you know, it has a future, can always reroute to the king's side. This bishop can land on e3, pressuring both sides of the board, supporting the knight. The rook's on an open file. This rook can come to g1 at a moment's notice. And yeah, white's pieces all looking very sensible. Black's, Black's rook on h5 is a bit loose, although active against the h pawn. Uh, this bishop is not looking ideal either, and the king, queen, and rook are all still stuck on the starting squares. This bishop as well, going to struggle to find a place to develop out to with all of these squares under white's control. So, the moral of the story is, in these openings, it doesn't matter what you're playing. It doesn't matter what you're playing. Um, the downside to g4 is that if black plays very, very accurately, uh, then he can maybe get some advantage with this h5 style of stuff. But the real downside, in my opinion, is black's opportunity to just develop his pieces without a fight. That is the real reason why these openings are bad practically, in my opinion. Um, Black could just develop normally, just put all the pieces on squares and then have a perfectly fine position. But in these games where white ends up winning, it's usually because black is you know, trying really hard to prove that this opening is just strictly unplayable. Uh, and that's just not the way to do things. So white, again, the victor in this opening battle. We see queen e7, king b1, just putting the king on a safer square. Knight f4 now for black, rook g1 bringing the rook into the game and supporting this knight. King f8 is how black decides to solve the problem of his king, but still, this is not an ideal uh, placement for this guy. Knight e2, and white again is now rerouting his final pieces over to the attack. This knight comes back to e6. We see a trade on e6, the second knight coming into g3 now, and bishop g5. And again, all of white's pieces serving a useful purpose here even this bishop defending this pawn. In the meantime, the rooks for black, uncoordinated. These pieces looking at nothing on the king's side. This bishop is useless. And yeah, I will say this bishop does look pretty nice on e6. This rook does exert some pressure on the h file. But in my opinion, just total harmony for white versus a very, very disjointed position here for black. And that is why white has the advantage. Rook d8. Bishop b2 is played in the game. And look at that. John Nunn got to take his h pawn. He did it. Opening refuted. Unplayable. H pawn falls. Um, but of course, just queen g2 now. And black is wasting even more time with this rook, it seems. Bishop c7 was John Nunn's choice in the game. But this move does turn out to be a pretty fatal mistake. Knight h5 appears on the board. And now there's no real way to stop the mounting threats against the black king. Rook takes d1 was played. Bishop takes d1. Sorry, rook takes d1 instead. Um, now again, these threats are a bit too strong. I think bishop takes and queen g7, queen g8 would be mate uh, to the king with the rook on the d file. And so John Nunn felt it was time to lose this rook again on the h file. Again, becoming a bit of a theme here. Bishop takes h5. White is up the exchange, and the game liquidated shortly after. Queen b4, bishop b2 is played, takes on c4. See captures, 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 captures. Queen g4, queen e6, captures, captures. Rook d7, and John Nunn threw in the towel. Another victim of Michael Baseman's opening nonsense. <clears throat> so Manny in the chat says, it doesn't matter what you're playing if the opponent doesn't punish it or plays mistakes. Well, I think you're missing the point, Manny. The reason why these openings are bad practically, why you don't see them more often, is because black, again, does have the option to sort of ignore the silliness, control the center, don't overextend, and develop all the pieces. That is why I don't like these openings. Not because of this crazy h4, h5 stuff trying to refute the opening. That, more often than not, I think, 
favors the side with the, you know, quote, objectively worse position is they're just going to be more familiar in it, right? It's a wild and crazy position. That's what they thrive on. That's why they're playing these openings. So you don't have to give that to them. Just develop your pieces, and life is good. All right. It's the moment we've all been waiting for. I've been leading up to this game the whole lecture. Maybe I've done a bad job of building suspense. But this is the main event here. We are going to look at Ulf Anderson against Michael John Baseman. And now, up to this point, it's been about what you would expect from this lecture entitled Horrible Openings. You know, your H6s, your G5s, your G4s from Michael John Baseman. The traditionally considered the worst opening moves. And this game might not be what, you're, what, what you'd expect. Um, Michael John Baseman starts off you know, quite normally, uh, you know, uh, according to, to normal principles, getting developed. But I think by the end of it, you'll agree with me, this is the worst opening Michael John Baseman has played all night and against, I think, the best player as well. Maybe you know, John Nunn and Jonathan Spielman, of course, very excellent players. I, I don't know how they match up against Ulf Anderson, actually, specifically. But in my mind, Ulf Anderson is just like a legend. So we'll see what happens in this game. Knight f3 by Ulf Anderson. And what do you think John Michael or Michael John Baseman does? Knight f3 refuting 1g5 by defending that square. How dare Ulf do this? Does he go a6? Does he go h6? These are also things that he's done, by the way. a6, h6, and then like, you know, e6. This is a well-known opening of his as well. No. He goes b6, an opening that actually develops pieces right away. I was, I was shocked. I was astounded. So g3 appears on the board. Bishop b7, getting developed. OK, so far so normal. Bishop g2. He even goes e6. He's developing a second bishop. What is this? This is not the Michael John Baseman I know. Castles. He goes d5, moving a pawn into the center of the board to control space. Wow. Shocking, revolutionary ideas. Uh, c4 for white. Both players playing very sensible moves. Knight f6 now for black. A move that develops the knight, controls the center, and doesn't horribly weaken the king's side. So far, so good. d4, bishop e7. We just have a very normal Catalan-style position. Knight c3, castles, knight e5. And here, Michael John Baseman does play h6, which, okay, you know, I mean, he's Michael John, you got it, he's gonna play h6 at some point, okay? Why not here? It's not the worst move ever. Um, bishop f4, and now, this is usually the phase of the game, right? We're still solidly in the opening, I would say. This is where the plans usually start to take shape for both sides, right? Normally, straight out of the opening, you're gonna see both sides starting to develop some kind of plan. You know, they're going to decide, am I activating my pieces on, you know, the king's side? Am I playing for a pawn break over here? Am I challenging the center with some move like c5? And this is normally the part of the game where that would start to become very, very clear, right? Both players played normal developing moves, got the bishops out, got castled. And now it's sort of decision time for both sides. What do both players want to play for? So what do you think Michael John Baseman decided he wanted to play for in this position? What should he do here? You know, you're playing with black against this cat. Should I start over from a few moves ago? Yeah. All right. All right. Welcome back. A few technical issues there. Hopefully now the uh, stream issue is fixed. So let's look back at this position, right? So where, hopefully you last heard me, I was talking up a big game about this position, talking about what black should be trying to do in this position, what a normal chess player would do. And I mentioned this idea, knight a6, or you know something like knight d7. Either move makes a lot of sense just getting the knight developed, and then after a few more normal moves, we would probably see something like c5 by black, you know, breaking in the center as you're taught to do, 
following up on your opening, entering the middle game phase by achieving you know, some sort of position with about level chances for either side. It's every chess player's dream with the black pieces, right? You just get a chess game. You know, something like c takes d5 and d takes c5 is perfectly playable. And I was talking about maybe getting some kind of IQP, right? Some normal chess position, right? Everybody's played an IQP at some point in their lives. Black has good control over e4, can activate the pieces on the c and e files, and life would be good. Life would be normal. But no, not Michael John Baseman. Instead of finishing development here and playing something like c5, which, you know, is perfectly perfectly reasonable for black, although admittedly this move h6 does seem a little bit like a wasted tempo to me. He plays the move a6 first, right? And I, I didn't really understand this move at first. I don't know what he's hoping to accomplish here. White plays the perfectly natural rook c1, and then black plays rook a7, and I definitely didn't see this coming. So what is black's idea? Well, perhaps if white plays another slow move, then black was interested in playing d takes c4, with the point being that he has defended his bishop one way or another. However, of course, there's an obvious refutation to this idea, which is the fact that white can capture on d5. Um, now, after capture on d5, black really isn't interested in taking back with the knight, because at the end of the day, the door is going to get shut on this bishop with something like e4, and white is now going to have a very, very substantial advantage Moves like queen a4 are coming, even moves like knight g4 are perfectly playable as well, with the ideas of d5 to follow up, pressure on the c file. White's going to be killing it here. So, after c takes d5, black played the move e takes d5, and uh, closed up the center. Now white plays the move queen b3. So like, you know, so far a6, rook a7, yeah, it's a cute idea, it's, it's a little bit unique, it's probably not objectively the greatest, but that probably isn't deserving of getting into uh, a lecture on the worst openings of all time, right? So why did I include this? Well, it's because of what happens next, right? You can argue that we're out of the opening, but in my opinion, a critical part of the opening is forming a solid plan for what comes next, either responding to your opponent's plan or, you know, doing something yourself for, for counterplay, playing for c5, you know, playing for pressure on the e pawn or something, playing to just even trade pieces is, you know, a, a plan of some sort. It's usually not a great plan, but it's a plan, right? So what do you think Michael John Baseman went for in this case, in this position? What plan did he, uh, did he choose? What plan does Michael John Baseman go for? Well, of course, as uh, everybody knows from the movie War Games, sometimes the only way to win is to not play at all. And so Michael John Baseman chooses uh, what is probably the worst plan in many, many cases, but seemingly working for him here, he chooses no plan at all. What does that look like? Well, he starts with the move Bishop A8 which is arguably improving the bishop, right? It was a bit vulnerable on b7 to some tactics sometimes on the diagonal or, or the file. Not that diagonal, but this diagonal. And on a8, it's a little bit tucked away. Rook fd1, and then king h7 appears on the board. And then after h3, you know, just a simple improving move by white. King g8 appears on the board. King h2, improving move by white. And then king h7 appears on the board. And then g4 is, is played. You know, white now taking space on the king side, sort of catching on to what's, what's happening here. And then king g8 is played. And then bishop e3, another perfectly fine improving move by white. And then bishop back to b7. You know, why not? The a8 was getting, you know, boring. May as well come back to, to b7. And then e3 is played by white, you know, controlling this central pawn. And then bishop a8 is, is Michael John Baseman's response. And then a3 by white taking even more, more squares away from black, and then bishop b7 again. And now, you know, Ulf, you know, Ulf buddy, he's known for his crushing endgame technique. He himself plays some uh, sort of odd openings with black. He's a big hedgehog type guy in many cases. These sort of openings where you don't directly go for the center sort of appeal to him in many cases. Uh, but, you know, even he has his limits, right? So 
after, let's see, what is this? This is the past eight moves. Black has just shuffled back and forth, doing absolutely nothing. Maybe, you know, Ulf, Ulfie here is getting a little bit bored. Plays the move F4, and he's like, all right, all right, F4, what are you going to do about that one, buddy? I'm coming after you. And so, of course, Michael John Baseman plays the move Bishop A8. And then uh, here, of course, of course, of course, white is winning. You cannot do this with black and achieve an objectively good position. You can't give your opponent 9-10 free tempi and then expect to come out on the other side with an objectively good position. That being said, though, what do you do with the white pieces? Like, what do you do? What is like, you don't, what do you do here? Right? So let's, let's try and come up with some sort of plan here for white and see if uh, we can sort of refute Michael John Baseman's idea here of sitting and doing nothing. <clears throat> so you guys are on the right track here. Of course, what white should do is take advantage of the fact that black's forces are sort of split and very, very, you know, compact, condensed, uh, by white's extra space in the center and on the king's side. And the way to take advantage of that space in this case, I think, is to play the move g5 and start opening things up along the king's side. Now, of course, you can play some more preparatory moves, which is what Ulf, Ulf Anderson does, especially, especially practically in this game. Even if objectively the best move is to play g5 immediately, if you're Ulf Anderson and you're sitting across the board from this guy, like why are you not going to bring all the pieces to the king's side before you do that? I, I don't know. It's pretty clear to me that he's not interested in improving his position. So rook d2 is Ulf's choice first. But yeah, I think you guys are on the right track. Moves like g5 are really what Ulf should be doing. Queen d6 now for black. f5. Queen back to d8. You know, apologies to Ulf, says Michael John Baseman. That almost looked like an active try. Better come back to d8 here. You opened up the diagonal and you showed me. Bishop f4, bishop back to b7. It's becoming a familiar picture. Rook over to g1 now. Ulf is uh, sort of, you know, getting into high gear. And now c6 is our first new move that changes the position by Michael John Baseman. Unfortunately, uh, it is just a move that you know, sort of further relegates him to passivity. Bishop f3 appears on the board now, um, unleashing this idea. And now knight h7. While still sort of doing nothing, Michael is at least at this point responding to his opponent's threats. Uh, rook c1 now switches sides a bit. We see bishop d6, and after knight a4, bishop c7, black has sort of restructured his pieces slightly. Uh, king g3, knight back to f6, h4, now knight back to d7. And here, believe it or not, white has sort of um, lost most of his advantage already, uh, which is hard to believe, right? But it turns out that Ulf, with moving these rooks back and forth, sort of delaying what he wanted to do, has allowed black to favorably restructure his position. Now, it's true that all of black's pieces are sort of jumbled together on the king's side, and they're all sort of serving very passive roles. Um, they are, are sort of just counteracting all of the white minor pieces, and white's ideas on the king's side are now going to come with a little bit less uh, force because black is going to get some counterplay on this dark squared diagonal. Of course, of course, of course, white is still better, but, you know, it's, it's, not, all, uh, it's not all lost for black. So what should have white have done? Well, it turns out way back here after something like queen d6, this move, f5, turned out to be a, a pretty critical mistake. So let's talk about why f5 turned out to be such a crucial mistake in this game. Well, of course, uh, white's idea to play against you know, black's setup here should be to open up files uh, either in the center of the board or on the king's side. And this pawn being on f4 is a really critical uh, contributor to that, right? It supports this knight on e5, so it can sort of never be moved supports ideas of g5, and indirectly, by supporting the knight on e5, it's actually helping to facilitate the idea of e4, right? You never have to worry about issues on the file uh, because this knight is so, so solid here on e5. So with f5, white is actually giving up a lot of his grip on the position. And the second we see f5 be played, 
uh, the seemingly random shuffling from Michael John Baseman actually turns into very purposeful shuffling, right? You see him regroup all of his pieces uh, to, yes, defend the b6 pawn, but also counterattack on the e5 square. So I'm going to say that f5 is the reason why Ulf Anderson isn't just winning this game outright. So that's important to keep in mind. You know, even if your opponent is, you know, staring at you with impunity and just shuffling back and forth forever, that doesn't mean you can just push all the way up the board. Every pawn move definitely comes with weaknesses and drawbacks. And the reason John Baseman, or Michael John Baseman is still in the game is because of this weakness, slight, slight weakness on e5. And here, Ulf actually cracks under the pressure. Uh, he should have just stuck with this knight on e5, done something like queen c3 to even further reinforce it, then continued with something like b4 as well, getting as much space as possible on the queen side. Instead, he takes on d7. And this move, of course, improves black's uh, saddest piece on b8. And after this, black isn't worse. Uh, it's a quality here. Uh, suddenly, Suddenly, black is, is very much still in the game. We see rook e2. Now e4 is still Ulf's idea, but it's sort of too little too late. Rook e8, black is ready to meet it. King h3 appears on the board. We see a trade of pieces on f4, trade of pieces on e2. Now queen e7 by uh, Michael John Baseman. Bishop f3, b5, knight c5, bishop back to uh, c8. And it does turn out that this move is actually a bit better. Because, uh, you know, that knight was very, very powerful, and getting rid of it as soon as possible makes a lot of sense. But bishop c8 is fine. Queen d3. And now, uh, black to move and start playing for the advantage. What do you guys think? Black to move and start playing for the advantage. <clears throat> what do you guys think? Well, it turns out here that, as always, when pushing forward, taking space, it comes with drawbacks. The drawbacks are the weaknesses left behind. This pawn on f5, for the moment, seems very, very solid. But after the move h5, white needs to be cautious. Um, in this case, Ulf Anderson makes one fatal mistake here. It actually captures on h5. Perhaps he was still dreaming of some kind of attack. You know, I'll play h6, rook g1. But it's just too little too late now. And these sort of, you know, th th this is the worst pawn structure I've seen in a long time here. h4, h5, f4, f5. It's, it's just bad. Uh, and now black is better. Queen f6 was played in the game. Knight takes c5. And that's an extra pawn for Michael John Baseman. And Ulf collapsed fairly shortly after. John Baseman getting to the e file now. And pushing c5. Finally. Um, Queen takes c5 does turn out to be the final mistake of the game. This queen is distracted from its defensive role on the uh, king side. It does turn out that d takes c5 would have been a playable move for white, although d4 is going to be putting some pressure on white's position here. Rook e3, bishop c6 to follow. But queen c5 played in the game, and now queen f5 is absolutely totally winning for black. Queen h3 is pretty impossible to stop here. Um, queen takes d5 was played in the game. Now queen h3 check, king f2, queen h2 check, bishop g2. Free pawns for Michael John Baseman. Uh, bishop f3, bishop g4 now, increasing the pressure here. Also, by the way, this rook is attacked. Rook c3, queen back to h2 check, bishop g2. More free pawns, king g1, rook e1 check, bishop f1, bishop, f bishop h3, and resignation. So, uh, as I said, I think this is the worst opening of the night by Michael John Baseman. Not because of the opening itself. You know, the first starting moves, of course, were very, very reasonable. It was just a normal Queen's Indian type of structure, putting the bishop on b7. But after that, a critical, critical part of the opening is the plan that you develop along the way. How you want to engage in an early middle game. And Michael John Baseman stopped playing that. He said, no, I'm done. I developed half of my pieces. That's good enough. My king's castle. What do I care? And he passed back and forth over and over and over and over again and then crushed uh, a fantastic chess player, Ulf Anderson. 
And that is the lecture tonight. Hopefully you guys enjoyed these pretty incredible games by uh, Baseman. I had a lot of fun looking at them beforehand and, and talking to you guys about them. Um, is there anything to take away from these games? If there is one really, really critical instructive point that I want you guys to remember, it's this idea of not trying to refute bad openings, right? When your opponent plays a bad opening, you do not need to refute it straight away. Uh, you need to take your time, develop your pieces, and play a normal game of chess. You know, even if you look at it afterwards with the computer, and the computer says, oh, you're an idiot, play H4, this is so good for you. Uh, I would recommend just playing good, solid, normal chess, and then you really can't go wrong against the, the craziness, even if you're playing a legend like Michael Sean Baseman. Uh, that's it for me here tonight. Uh, I will be continuing live on Twitch directly after this with Tactics Time. Once again, thank you all so much for watching. My name is Caleb Denby, and I will see you next time.